brain and we know exercise is good for the heart. And so we're investigating how exercise can then benefit the brain. And so I'm gonna be talking about some of the research that we do here in the lab. Uh, but first, kind of here's an outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, just the background uh, with the brain's vascular demand during exercise. Uh, some of the devices that we use uh, within our lab. And then uh, how we use those devices. And we ultimately kind of model this vascular response and how age, uh, sex, gender, and exercise intensity play a role. And then I'm just going to briefly talk about a meteor study that we have going on right now. So uh, when you exercise, blood flow has to go, has to increase in the brain. Uh, the brain does not hold much energy storage. So your muscle holds quite a bit of glucose as energy and uh, will transition into proteins and such when it needs it but there's much more storage in the muscle as opposed to the brain. The brain really does not hold energy uh, in terms of glucose. That's the per preferred uh, energy source is sugar. And so you have to increase that flow to give the energy that it needs. And so when you exercise, you get a decent increase in uh, blood flow within the brain. And there's kind of different mechanisms that drive this increase in blood flow. One is autoregulation. So you know when you exercise, your blood pressure increases. That's going to play a role in blood flow. Uh, you have a term called neurovascular coupling. Uh, that's the communication between the nerves or your nervous system and your vascular system. And so if you can think your muscles are firing, it needs uh, that blood flow to the brain to then transmit the signals to your legs to move. And then we have uh, cerebral vascular reactivity. And that is when we get to the higher intensity, uh, that's the main driver and that's your CO2. Uh, when you increase your exercise uh, intensity, CO2 is going to go up in the uh, blood, and CO2 is a very prominent dilator. So that's a big factor here, which you can see a big increase in flow, and a lot of it has to do with the CO2 in the blood. Uh, but once you see, once you pass this kind of anaerobic threshold or your really intense uh, exercise, that blood flow starts to go down. And that is because you're hyperventilating or you've increased your breathing rate so much that you're now blowing out that CO2 and in the blood it's reducing and therefore blood uh, flow goes down. So the CO2 in the brain uh, and in the vessels and in the blood is a prominent uh, dilator and is a big reason why we get uh, increased blood flow in the brain during exercise. And so what we use to assess the brain blood flow is called transcranial Doppler ultrasound. It's similar to an ultrasound that maybe you've had before in that we place a probe here on the temporal window. And what we're trying to target is called the middle cerebral artery. It's an artery that is providing blood to the majority of the brain. Um, and it's probably the largest, well, it is the largest of these basal arteries. Uh, but you can see that we can also target what's called the PCA or the posterior cerebral artery. And then the ACA, which is the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, these are smaller arteries and they're targeting different parts of the brain. Uh, but because partly what we're interested in is cognition and such, uh, the MCA or the middle cerebral artery is feeding those, reg uh, those regions. And so we, uh, that's our main target is the MCA. And this is coming off of the circle of Willis. So at the very bottom of the brain, you have this circle of Willis that you can see here, over here. And the circle of Willis just allows you to get uh, blood flow where you need it. Um, and it's designed such that 
if you have a blockage here, you can still get blood flow out to where you need to. So it's kind of designed as a safety mechanism. And uh, so there's usually this question of uh, we're looking at blood in the brain. Uh, so why not do like an MRI or uh, the fancier kind of imaging of arterial spin labeling and such? And you may know um, through your insurance and such, the cost of an MRI uh, is extremely expensive. Uh, use of the TCD is much cheaper. And uh, some of the other imaging, like the PET imaging, uh, can, well, it does give you a uh, radiation exposure. But mainly why we like the transcranial Doppler ultrasound is it gives us a much better uh, temporal resolution, temporal being time. So we can see in real time your blood flow within the brain on a beat to beat basis. And so we're able then to, because we have it on a time frequency and we get it in real time, we can put someone through exercise and see their response, which is what I will be talking about here in a second. But what we take from here, so this is what we collect, and then we're able to model it uh, for data analysis. And so this is the setup. Uh, we have up here on the head is that trans transcranial Doppler ultrasound or TCD, and it's connected to an acquisition software and then sent out here to our main computer for MATLAB, which is where we process and record our data. And here's uh, the other system. Uh, we also put EKG on like you may have had before so we can track heart rate. And we have a normal blood pressure cuff that you would get in a clinical setting. We also capture uh, CO2. So as I mentioned, CO2 is a very prominent dilator and uh, plays a major role in cerebral blood flow. We capture what uh, that end title is that you're breathing out of the nose. And then over here on the hand, it is our Finipress system, which gives us a beat to beat blood pressure. And uh, so for our exercise design, we use a new step. Uh, so that is beneficial because uh, it's one, it's non-weight bearing as opposed to like a treadmill or such. Um, and we're able to hook up all of our equipment. And uh, it's really important to keep the arms elevated and supported uh, with the Finipress because it's a very finicky device. Um, and so this allows the participant to be comfortable. Uh, we're still able to reach heart rates and uh, keep clean signals. And so here's uh, a paper that, a figure from a paper we just put out maybe not even quite a year ago. And what's lacking in the research currently is that a lot of this field has been uh, focused on males. Um, primarily the reason is they say estrogen and the female hormones disrupt blood flow and things like that. And males are easier. Uh, we're finding that that's not necessarily true. Um, but what is true is females almost across the board or the lifespan have a higher resting blood flow. And it's usually about not until the 70, 80 year old range that they start to get a little bit closer. And uh, so this uh, sex difference is an interest of ours and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but with older adults, we're also seeing that being physically active throughout your lifespan uh, keeps your resting blood flow to the brain a little bit higher than your sedentary individuals. And so that's across the entire age range. So what this suggests is being active is important for blood flow to the brain and for maintenance across the lifespan. And uh, so this is our modeling that we use. So as I mentioned, we, we take that bit to beat analysis and we model it to look at the response in blood flow during exercise. And from this modeling, we're able to get 
just the resting value, the time delay. So that's the start. When we start exercise, how long it takes to get a response in the blood flow, uh, how big the response is, and then the steady state. And so with those values, we compare across groups. And so what we're seeing is age matters. Uh, older adults, probably for normal aging region, reasons, uh, blood flow response during exercise is just not as big as a young adult, um, probably due to vascular stiffening that happens with aging. Uh, but what's interesting is this is seen within females and males. Uh, so you can't really see it here, but the open dots, this line right here is females, um, same here. And then the solid dot is males. So young females, young males have a bigger, much larger response than older males and females. And so this is a big table, but what we see in uh, resting adults, so older, as I mentioned, just across the board, older adults have lower blood flow at baseline during rest. Uh, we see that the men, though, have a little bit greater response uh, during exercise, that's possibly due to intensity and such. But when you actually get to values, there's not really much of a difference in young individuals of males to females, but there is still a little bit of a difference in men and older women. Uh, so older men still have a little bit lower rest uh, exercise velocity to uh, women. So what we're seeing is there are sex differences and uh, we should be taking that into consideration within um, our studies. Uh, and also intensity matters. Um, so it's not surprising that if you do a lower intensity, then you're not gonna get as much of an increase in blood flow to the brain as uh, you would think of a higher intensity. Uh, but if you remember that curve I showed you, you don't wanna go too high because then the blood flow starts to decrease. So our hypothesis is that if we kind of maximize and get you to intensity that keeps blood flow elevated uh, below that threshold, that that's going to be more beneficial uh, than kind of the lower intensities. And so what we're seeing also pathology uh, matters. So this top line is an active, healthy young adult. So as I've shown you, much larger uh, increase in response during exercise. But then here is a sedentary older adult. Um, so you see not much of a response. There's a little bit of one. Uh, but what's kind of concerning is this is an individual that has had a stroke um, is, and is age and sex matched to this sedentary older adult. Uh, so a population of interest within our lab is stroke survivors. And uh, we're going to be looking to see if we can manipulate uh, this response with an exercise training program. And so to talk about Meteor, so this is a study that's on, uh, I'm ongoing right now. Uh, you might have heard uh, Eric Vidani or um, Amanda Zabarid talk about the Comet study, which is in older adults. And it has four groups, it has a toning and stretching the aerobic exercise group, the resistance training group, and then the aerobic exercise plus the resistance training group. And so I am pulling in some of those subjects uh, that agree to be in our study. And my question is, does any of this exercise change that cerebral blood flow response? Um, everything I've shown you to date is kind of cross-sectional in that it's just one time. Uh, so what we really don't know is if exercise does change cerebral blood flow and what's, if it does, what's the mechanisms behind it? And so what we're doing is, so this is a rebreathing bag technique. As I mentioned, CO2 is a very prominent dilator and we use it uh, as a surrogate for arterial stiffness uh, within the brain. So I fill this balloon up with room air uh, the participant will put their mouth around uh, this piece 
And then I direct the airflow in and out of the bag. Uh, this is connected to our capnograph or our CO2 analyzer. And it progressively, with every breath that the individual takes, it progressively increases the CO2 within their system. And we manipulate the blood flow essentially within the brain through that CO2 mechanism. Uh, and that gives us an idea of broadly vascular health, but uh, specifically more so around uh, cerebral, the arterial stiffness of the vessel. And then uh, another assessment we do is to assess uh, auto regulation. Uh, and so this is a paced breathing technique where over here on this right side, you breathe out and then it switches over or you, you breathe in over here and then you switch over to the breathe out. And what that does is it slows down your breathing rate to about six breaths per minute. Uh, normally, a normal rate is about 12 to 14. So in this technique, we are uh, manipulating pressure essentially, and we're able to look at how pressure affects the blood flow within uh, the brain. And then as I mentioned uh, before, and what I've shown you is this is our exercise setup. And so we have them go through our exercise uh, protocol that is six minutes at the low end of a moderate intensity. And so hopefully uh, I'll be able to kind of use this data to uh, calculate the effect size for a much larger study and kind of start to get at uh, the dosing question. Cause that's usually the question we get, well, how much exercise should I be doing uh, to improve brain health? And the answer is we really don't know yet. Um, and that's what we're kind of trying to get at. And uh, so just to give an overview of our lab, we do quite a bit in our lab. So I mentioned everything I've been talking about is our supravascular work, uh, but we also do peripheral vascular. So we're starting to move into that um, and do a little bit more of that. And that's through a flow media dilation, uh, pulse wave velocity, uh, we have a cardiac room where we can do uh, stress tests and such, um, exercise testing. You guys might have gone through some of that. Uh, and then we have functional walking tests and strength that we do. Um, and then we have a space to actually do exercise training. And so this is acknowledgments. Um, I'm currently under a TL1 grant which funds uh, quite a bit of my time. And then Dr. Billinger, who is the PI of this lab, uh, works for, is affiliated with the Alzheimer's Disease Center and so under the P30 grant. And so that is my time. Any questions? Everyone has my microphone now. Is it working better? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Um, my apologies for that. I'm very sorry. Uh, Dr. Aaron, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, very insightful and informative. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, someone would, um, I would like to participate in the meteor study after completing the NICE study in mid-November. Criteria to participate. Is that something you're familiar with, Stacey, to answer? Uh, yeah, so uh, to be in the meteor study, you have to be in the comet study. So once you finish up uh, your other study, I would investigate and look into comet. They're going to be enrolling for a while. Um, and that's that uh, the comet study is a year long uh, exercise intervention that you'll be randomized to. Um, so if you meet all the criteria for comet, uh, then you'd be able to participate in meteor. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. So who Other would questions? I contact? Who would I contact to get into the Comet study first? You would reach uh, out to our research team and I can put mm -hmm. the phone number in the chat for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You bet. Um, I see age requirements for Comet. I think they're 60 to 85. 
is that 60, 65 to 85, I think. It's older adults. Let me pull up the comment study. Yeah, I can't exactly though. remember. Comment is in person. Yes, you actually go to a Y, um, YMCA, and you meet with a trainer um, several times, a few times a week. And then the amount of times uh, that you meet with a trainer decreases throughout the duration of the study. Other questions for Dr. Aaron while I'm looking for some more um, comment information. Do we call other than the main phone number, the uh, 588-0555? That's who you call. That's exactly who you call for oh, um, any research. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Option yeah. one. That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So says Trisha said 65 to 80 for comment. Yeah. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you. Um, and then Valerie says, what did RT represent? Uh, that's resistance training. So there's a strength training component um, and that's one of the arms. So sorry about that one. Uh, it can, uh, for Ed's question, does the reduction in dilation with anaerobic exercise drop below pre-exercise level? Uh, currently, one of our PhD students is doing high intensity interval training. Um, and as exercise goes on, as duration increases and you are really getting to those very high intensities, uh, it can drop below uh, baseline level. Other questions for Dr. Is, Aaron? Is that good or bad to drop below the baseline level? I'm, I'm not quite following. We don't, uh, we don't actually know. Uh, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, well, there's debate. Uh, so high intensity interval training is becoming very popular in uh, clinical populations like cardiac rehab, uh, but we don't actually know what that does to the brain. Um, it's a question we have within our lab. Um, I will say people are not having big, large adverse effects. It's not causing a stroke or anything like that. Uh, but in terms of an actual training intervention over time, is it going to improve vascular health or cognition? Uh, we still don't know. Okay, talking about stroke, my husband had a stroke at 56. He's mm -hmm. now 76. It's going on 20 years. He just walks. Not a lot. He walks two, three times a week um, and then does stuff around the yard. Is that sufficient? I mean, the doctor has told him he needs to do something and he does, yep. but I, I, I can't it's, push him, but yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, anything is better than nothing, right. um, but uh, I will say having planned, uh, structured, having doing those walks with a purpose um, yes. whether it be like a certain time or you know how hard you feel like you're working uh will do a little bit more than just kind of going for a stroll but i will say getting up and walking is great that's much better okay. than doing nothing yeah because he'll even even if his buddy can't join him he will often go to um you know our facility just to walk yeah. for an hour too yeah that's great okay. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions while we have Dr. Aaron still here with us for a few more minutes? Okay, I'll have another question. Um, <laughs> I, I do exercise, um, like today I did two and a half classes, one really high intensity, the next one I did part of the class and then I did a chair yoga class, which was fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing a lot of exercise already, does that make me a better candidate or not as good a candidate for the Comet study and then moving into the Meteor study? Uh, right now, Comet's criteria is to be more sedentary. 
yeah. than active. They do have a threshold in terms of activity, in terms of who they're enrolling. Interesting. Okay, well, I'll see what they say. I've already done <laughs> two half day studies and completing the NICE study. Oh, um, nice. Good. So, um, I'll see what I can do next because I really enjoy and I, you know, I'm happy to participate in these studies. Great, we'd love to hear that. And when you call us, we can go over all of the studies that we have um, going on, accepting enrollment. So we can okay. visit with you about all of those. Yeah, okay, great. I've already mm -hmm. sent applications in and that's how I got into the NICE study, if I remember correctly. So thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, it looks like we have a question about duration for HIT. Uh, currently, what's typically done is uh, somewhere between five to 10 intervals. Uh, so intervals being the high bout and the low bout. Um, and there's a little bit of discrepancy with the literature. So the traditional kind of exercise athlete is a one-to-one -one ratio. And so that's one minute high to one minute low. Uh, what's more done in the clinic is doing a kind of a switch where you do maybe one minute high and then two minutes low. Uh, so it's kind of just your preference and uh, your ability level. But the duration, uh, the purpose of HIT is to be shorter in duration and get a bigger response with less time. Uh, so I would say 10 minutes is right now kind of what um, what's kind of done in the, the research with showing uh, improvement in cardiovascular changes. As I mentioned with the brain, we don't quite know yet, but um, with cardiovascular changes, 10 to kind of 15 minutes or 10 intervals is kind of where we're at. Great, thank you, Dr. Aaron. All right, Dr. Aaron, thank you so much for being with us today and for your presentation. And again, to everyone, my apologies for my microphone not working. I'm sorry about, we will test it ahead of time next time. Um, we will have the recording of this presentation available on our website and we look forward to seeing everyone next Thursday at two o'clock 